Hello and welcome to today's Commonwealth Club program. I'm Gloria Duffy, President and CEO of the club and our moderator for today. The club has returned to in-person events at 110 The Embarcadero in San Francisco. We have an exciting one coming up tomorrow at 1230 as we host a small group discussion with Dr. Mary Daly, President of the San Francisco Federal Reserve and a member of the Fed's Open Market Committee. We'll be discussing inflation and interest rates. Visit CommonwealthClub.org to sign up for the live program or the online version, also to join or support the club. You can also support us right now with a tax-deductible gift by clicking the blue Donate button on your screen. We'd like to thank the Bernard Osher Foundation for supporting today's Good Lit event. Now it is my great pleasure to welcome my very good friend, Mary Les Casto, founder of Casto Travel and now chair of MVC Solutions. Several years ago, the club honored Mary Les, among other notable Bay Area leaders, with our Distinguished Citizen Award as a first-generation immigrant who had achieved major success in their first generation in the United States. She is a successful entrepreneur, a community leader, an investor, and the author of her new book, A Hole in the Clouds, From Flight Attendant to Silicon Valley CEO. Growing up on a plantation in the Philippines, fascinated by flying and travel, Mary Les started her career as a flight attendant for Philippine Airlines, and she has over 40 years of experience in the travel industry. With tremendous determination, focus, and grit, from a $1,500 startup to a $200 million com company, uh, her journey with Casto Travel has been a fascinating one. Her company grew as she worked from the time they were startups with Silicon Valley tech giants, including Intel, Apple, and Kleiner Perkins, and of course, with their colorful leaders like Steve Jobs and Andy Grove. We are so excited to hear more about her path to success and about the current status and future prospects for the travel industry. If you have questions for Mary Les, please submit them in the chat, and I will include them in the discussion. Mary Les, what a treat to have you with us today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gloria. And it's a privilege to be a part of this uh, conversation today, um, being involved in the club for as many years as I have. And it was time to write my book to tell the story. And that's what I think I'd like to do that today. Yeah. yeah. Well, it seems that you use the pandemic time in a very productive way to write your book and get it published really in that period of time. Yes, I did. Yeah. And uh, this was a book that I, I wanted to write many years ago because of the experiences and I really wanted to share. And in many ways, it was a way of saying thank you. Thank you to everybody that participated, made this journey of mine a really exciting one. And, uh, and so that was what really precipitated me to start thinking about the book. It actually had to be done. And uh, and I'm really glad I did it. <laughs> well, so. I can attest. It's a great book, a very fun story, really. So let's start by asking you about the title, A okay. Hole in the Clouds. What does that mean? Well, when I was a little girl, uh, again, as you said, you know, we were raised in a sugar plantation and my father had an airplane, a small airplane, and he would be flying from one place to the other. And he would take the children, us flying with him. Uh, none of my brothers and sisters really enjoyed flying as much as I did. So we would take off in this plane. And my father's assignment to me was always to look for the hole in the clouds, because he felt that if we do that, we would go on a smoother uh, flight and uh, conditions were better, and that we would do maneuvers, acrobatic maneuvers, which I loved. And that became uh, that became what my love affair for tra travel really started. And that became a natural transition for me as I was growing up, that travel was going to be very much a part of my, my life. And, um, and naturally, uh, 
as I grew up, then you know, I became a flight attendant and it was just normal. That was an easy transition because at that time there was really no job opportunities for women at, my, at that level, at that age, except being a flight attendant. And um, I really wanted to serve people and again, loved the flying. It just became very natural that that was the career I chose. So I don't want to lose the story of your childhood and your growing okay. up in the Philippines, okay. uh, but it does seem like a hole in the clouds is a metaphor for finding opportunities and yes. moving through them. So I want, I want to get back to that, but okay. tell us what it was like growing up. Your family had a sugar plantation and also a coconut plantation. Is yes. that correct? Yes. And you had what, seven kids in your family? Family, yes. Uh, four, uh, yes. Three sisters and four brothers. And yeah, and we, we really grew up, um, but we really, until such time when we had to go to school, we really didn't spend a lot of time except during the summers and Christmas holidays because there was no schooling. We had to go to different provinces to get to school. But it was, it was so much fun because the family was um, with a big house and in, in the family, um, my grandfather, who was from Switzerland, uh, he left Switzerland when he was 18 years old to find his fortune, ended up in the Philippines and started the sugar plantation. And during that time, it was tradition where the patron with the people in the farm would play tribute to the patron. And during Christmas, the daughter of his foreman, and he was in the balcony receiving all the people, the gifts that they came in, the daughter of the foreman sang to him and he fell in love with my grandmother. And that was my Filipino grandmother. And so growing up, we used to see paintings of them in each side of the hallway and, uh, and got to know. Uh, but then when my grandmother, after seven, they had seven children, she passed away. My grandfather went back to Switzerland and lo and behold, the girlfriend he left behind there when he moved to the Philippines was, was also a widow with seven kids. So he married her and brought her back to the Philippines, and she was the one who raised my mother. So, so was... 14, 14 aunts and uncles. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. And a lot of them so, are in Switzerland. Yeah. So what was that like, again, to grow up? Uh, you, you sort of ran around, you had the run of the, the countryside. Yeah. And what about school? Uh, where did you, how did you go to school? Uh, really, we did not until we were boarders. We had to go to different uh, provinces. Uh, I went to, we went to Bacolod City. The girls did in the girls' school. And the boys went to Ateneo, which is in Cagayan de Oro. And that's where they were. We were all boarders because there were no schools. And, uh, and then pre uh, after that, my mother decided she was going to buy a house in Cebu City. And that's where the family was. And, you know, this is what during our high school days. Uh, but really mostly, mostly in, in, in the boarding class. We grew up in boarding schools. So you graduated from high school and you said that um, there were not opportunities for women at that point. Um, right. So what, what were your alternatives and how did you go on to become a flight attendant? Well, my sister, my cousins were all flight attendants. My my uncle was vice president of Philippine Airlines at that time. And it became, there was no job opportunities and flight attendants at that time really had a stature. You know, everybody wanted to be a flight attendant because you wear your uniforms and, you know, you just, and then oh, at that time we had a two months training, not like today, but two months training on how to really learn how to address clients and participation and, you know, all the little details on wine, on cheese and food and how you service. It was a finishing school, very much a finishing school. So by the time you finished, you really were adapted to taking care of clients. And I, my love for, for personal service, really, I, it enhanced the feeling I had of this is really what I want to do. And so I, my sister started as a flight attendant. And when I joined, uh, she then resigned because she was married, but I, I wanted to just continue flying. And that's how I got my training. And, and it blew so all over. Mm -hmm. your parents were okay with this? Uh, uh, you... Not really, but again, you know, it was again, an opportunity for me and that's really what I wanted to do. And so they, they gave me an approval. 
that I could join the airlines. And you had a little bit of a background as a rebel, if I recall. Oh, yes. You have some stories oh, God, about school. Catholic school and... Uh... I hated, I hated school. I really did because it was so, uh, you know, again, as you said, being the farm, I mean, we, 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 my mother was really not very strict. Just my sister was very strict. But we just had to run around. I mean, we just, we did, we rode the, bo- the buffaloes and uh, not the buffaloes, the water buffaloes. And we dived and we climbed trees. I mean, we were very wild in many ways. And then, and disciplined. And then you go to school and the nuns were just very, yeah, they were very disciplinarian. And I, I didn't like that. I mean, I, I got very restless in class and I was very naughty, very, very naughty. And one time, uh, they were running out of punishments for me. And one time uh, I had to put a waste basket. I did something really bad, I'm sure. And, you know, so the nuns were going to discipline me and had me run around with a, with a basket, um, waste basket on top of my head. So to shame me. Uh, but I decided, you know what? I'm not going to have them shame me. I just went to each of the classrooms, started dancing around and singing. And before I knew it, <laughs> everybody was participating. So... <laughs> That kind of discipline uh, turned back. <laughs> yeah. So again, I always, I always have this thing about, you know, no rules. And, you know, I want to do it my way. And again, you know, that was showing in my, my independence. So. So you danced and sang your way then into your yeah. job as a flight attendant. And yeah. what happened then? Where did you go? And what did you do? Well, then I became a flight attendant and then I started flying for the airlines and, you know, again, the experiences of being at that particular time, you know, we're flying the DC trees, we're flying poker planes and de- yeah, I mean, um, but the experience of taking care of people, my, I remember my first flight and um, I had to go to, we were flying to a, a place in the Philippines, it was the southern part, and that was mostly where, um, it was not, I would say not safe, but it was. Um, and my first passengers, the flight was full and immediately there were two tribal warriors that came in with their full their regala with their swords and everything else. And I was just, you, you know, the signs to do not bring any firearms or deposit your firearms or, you know. And uh, I tried to ask them if I could get their swords and they absolutely said no. And so I went to the pilot, I said, what will they do? I have two passengers here and he said, where are they? Are they tribal leaders? I said, yes. He said, well, they'll never give you their sword because that is their authority. So I had to make sure that they were stopped. I put them right in the back part so I could watch them. I was glued to them. And um, but they were very nice. And at the end of that, I distributed a tray to give to everybody. They decided they were going to keep it. And I was not going to argue with them. But, you know, all the experiences of flight attendant and some of them were good, and one of them was really, and I write about this in my book, when a very good friend of mine, we were having lunch, and we, were, we said that we would meet each other after lunch. Um, she left ahead of me, and after I was ready to go, um, the pilot called me and said there was a crash landing, and we flew over the side, and my girlfriend passed to, and the whole group, you know, all the passengers, fine. And then that's when you really think, you know, you have to be very, very careful. This is this job also is, you know, there's a lot of, it's not an easy job, you know, because you always take, uh, you know, you fly every day and you really don't know uh, how, how precious life is. And at the age of 18, 19, that was something that, you know, brought into mind how fleeting our lives are and to take advantage of every opportunity. Uh, but I still wanted to fly. And um, there was one time when we were flying again and the pilot called me in the cockpit and said, we have a fire in our engine. It was flying one of the DC trees and prepared the passengers for landing for, and uh, and all of a sudden I'm looking around and I thought, oh my gosh, this is really happening. And so I went through my, my little book about what to do and told the passengers for impact landing. This is what you have to do. And, and I knew my father was waiting for me and I was very nervous about that. So but the pilot did a fabulous uh, landing. He did a, they formed the runway and we landed. And when I opened the airplane, all the passengers left. And my father grabs me and he said, you're not going to fly. You're going to resign right here. And I said, no, I can't. I have to take another flight because I don't want this to be the end. I, I want to continue. This is the choice I made and I want to continue flying. 
and and that's what I did. So, mm. so um, then you met a young man, and yes. you ended up coming to the U.S. Tell us that story. Yes, I did. I had never dated an American, and my girlfriend uh, was one of the top models in the Philippines. She was dating a lot of Americans. She invited me to a party, and. Um, and, 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 and I met him, I had seen a picture of him before and a very attractive man. And I just felt, oh, wow, this is, this is really somebody I wanna meet. And um, so I did have a date with him, a blind date with him. And, and then I, we ended up just talking. It was, it was just unbelievable. I'd never really dated anybody aside from my group. And uh, he was just, I mean, he really listened. We had great conversation and, I just knew at the end of the day that I was going to marry him. Of course, he had no idea about that, but <laughs> then women decide. And, and then I started to tell my father, I think you need to pay attention to this young man that I'm going to marry. And, um, and we did. And so we had a wedding in the Philippines, and then we moved to this country. And I will have to tell you, I was very unprepared. Yeah. Uh, flying in the United States as, as flight attendant, I, you know, you flew in here, you saw things, and but living here is actually very different because I had to become an American wife to learn all the things that I was unprepared for, and uh, you know, learning how to cook, learning how iron, and oh my God, yeah, I thought this is just yeah, and we didn't have a lot of money because he was a student, he was trying to get back uh, to school and. Uh, and so I, I knew that I had to I had to make some changes, and but Mardell was very patient with me, and I will tell you that I mean he he made a lot of um, he made it easier for me, and so I I would remember when we were in uh, down south we had an apartment down south, and I would wait for him to come home because I had no friends I was so lonely, and the only person that made friends was the landlady that owned the apartment. And she would come up every day and she would tell me, honey, it's time, it's time. And she'd come up with her little cigarette and, you know, and we'd go downstairs and watch roller derby. <laughs> and and <laughs> that was our entertainment. And she, would, she was really kind. She was trying to teach me a lot of the vocabulary she used were not you know, things that she would normally say, but uh, she was my friend and I, I was... Yeah, I, she, yeah, I will always remember her kindly because she took an interest in me, trying to teach me. And then I decided I needed to do more. I needed to be independent because I was very concerned about that. In the meantime, my parents came to visit and uh, also to see how I was doing. I think my father more than anything else wanted to be sure that, you know, that I was in the right place and because he was so against his marriage. And then I think I wanted to show him that I can make it happen. And, and that's really what, what, what we did, yeah. So. Mardell had been in the military and then he settled he into was. a yeah, business and career. And so what did you do next? Uh, I then he, uh, he, I, he said I had to go back to school. I had to go back to work. And so I had no training except being a flight attendant. And at that time, you couldn't be married and fly. And so that's why I could no longer be with the airlines when I moved to this country. So I learned and he taught me that I had all the capabilities of doing sales. And uh, so I started working as an even lady and bought all the products. I ended up not selling anything except I bought them all because I, I was so petrified of going out and cold calling. And uh, then I ended up working for Macy's as a salesperson. I blew that too, because I didn't know how to give rap. And you know, all the little things that I felt like, oh my God, I'm so in that inadequate. And then a girlfriend of mine who was still a flight attendant, she, was, she and I was having lunch. And she said, why don't you think about being a travel agent? Which I never even thought about. And so there was an opportunity that I, found an ad in the paper and uh, I applied for it and I got hired. And that was really my first entry into the travel industry. Your first hole in the clouds. The first hole in the clouds. And that was so, exactly what. <laughs> so um, you worked for an agency and then I think you bought an agency or started yes, it. 
Was yeah, it? I did. I worked, I worked for three other agencies. I was getting restless every time. The first agency was, he was, he didn't know. I mean, he didn't need the business. So I think he just did it for just because he enjoyed being in the travel. But he was horrible with his clients. And I learned from him. Not, I learned a lot of what not to do in the last, the three companies that I learned uh, that I worked for. And I was always very obsessed about clients that you had to anticipate clients mood. You had to learn about what they wanted, pay attention to the little details. And so those were really my, my people's skills. And uh, Mark always says that I, I learned, I had my PhD in, in, in the airlines because I really did. Yeah. And I learned, I would sit at the airport and wait for people checking in and out because I felt like to learn how a passenger travels, you got to look at you know, how do they check in? What's behind the counter? I mean, what are the challenges that they would go? I mean, all these little things that I felt would help me and educate me. Um, so I applied all those knowledge as I was starting to, to build my resume. And the last agency I worked was called Travel Planners. And I started with three people. There were only three of us. And when I left, there was 30 people. And we started handling little accounts. We handled a GE account. And then Intel, there were like a hundred people at that time. And uh, I learned that it was really the travel assistants, the, the secretaries that really were the people that I should get to know because I didn't know the passengers, but I knew the attendant, the secretaries. And if I did a good job for them, you know, I would take care of their, their travel needs as well. So I developed a really strong relationships with a lot of the, uh, the travel assistants. And then my girlfriend who was, I was handling the corporate business. The company was divided into corporate business and the vacation business. And my girlfriend Lee was in the vacation business. So between the two of us, we started talking about, you know, you know our frustration because again, the same thing, they weren't taking care of the employees. Um, so I knew that I could do a better job and I was really frustrated so she and I talked about it. And again, my girl's influence is very strong because he kept saying, you can make this happen. And sure enough, she and I decided we were going to go. We were going to quit. We didn't tell anybody. We just resigned. And um, so we did. We left. And then uh, we ended up um, getting an office in Los Altos. We had no money except what we invested, that 1500 each. And we opened a little office and we had, uh, we bought our desk from Repo Depot and we had ferns as decorations and old maps and, and then nothing happened. <laughs> Waiting for the phone to ring, nothing happened. And so we started going cold calling and, uh, and then I would go uh, hit the pavements and, and just, you know, look and see what opportunities we have and, I was walking down Great America Parkway, and I'll remember this always. And of course, I had to always dress well because I felt like I was representing myself and the company, and I had on high heels, and oh my God, it was so hard. And I was walking, and I broke my heels, and I was watching this man from, from a window, and he was paying attention. I thought, well, that's the first live person I've seen in that office, in the corner office, so maybe I'll just walk in. And, I did, and I said to the receptionist, I want to see that man, meet the man that's in the corner office. And she said, well, do you have an appointment? And I said, no, I don't. And she said, well, let me see what I can do. And so she called him, and he came out. It was Ken Oshman from, the, the, from Rome Corporation at the time. Right. And Ken as, was as so we, nice. As we used to refer to it, he was the O in Rome. That's right, the O in Rome. And he was so nice. And he, I didn't get the business, of course, but... He was so patient. And, you know, at that time in the Valley, everybody really knew each other. Uh, uh, so, but I got the business after a while, after I was all settled, they gave me some of the business, but not at that time. And I, I just, the phone never rang. And um, my next door per, uh, person that lived across from the office was Sandra Kurtzig of Ask Computer. And Sandy was just she was one of the pioneers as well. And she was just going, oh, her office, her company was just going crazy. And I wanted to learn something from her. So I went to visit with her. 
And what I enjoyed about Sandy is Sandy was who she was. She never changed. Uh, she was tough, uh, but she knew her business. And uh, and I thought, you know what? I'm going to be like Sandy because I I you know I knew that I could. I knew that I was good. I was very very good, and I believed in that. I knew that the company, you know, the company was going to be all right. Yeah. What, so. what year are we in as you begin to make these connections and gain inroads into the new Silicon Valley companies? Around what time was this? I think probably in the 80, in the 80s. I think mm-hmm. it was in the 80s. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we're starting to. Yeah, and uh, Lee and I. And then the phone rang. Finally, after two months, I would say the phone rang, and it was Sue McFarland saying something happened to Andy's reservations. And that, Andy, that's Buck, Andy yeah. Grove of in, Intel. Andy Grove, and he was at the time general manager. But then I think he became vice president. And Andy's first question is, how could Marilis have made a mistake? And Sue said, it's not, not, it's not Marilis, she's no longer here. And he said the magic word, find her. So here I am, Sue calls me and she says, Andy wants you to handle the Intel department he's in. And I said, Sue, that's wonderful, but I don't have the money. We had to pay the airlines every week for tickets that we used. I said, I don't have the money. And he said, oh, my goodness. So what are we going to do? I said, I don't know, but I'd love to get the account. But financially, I can't afford it. So they arranged for me to get $20,000 to put in their account. So wow. that was my first fee. Wow. And then after the, after I got that call, the second call was Al Sugart from Seagate. And now it wasn't Seagate yet, it was Sugar Associate. The same thing, Al wanted me to handle his business. And again, the same thing, I said, I have no money. So he said, I'll pay you cash every time you deliver tickets. So those two people really helped me get my business going. And then, of course, the Apple came in and flat kind of that, line that, that was when the Silicon Valley community was was very small and, and everybody Correct. knew each other. And Correct. Your, your, your business is a, an example of how as that industry, as the tech industry rose, those who supported and helped and worked with the tech industry also rose. So Correct. tell us about the expansion of your business from those early days with Andy Grove at Intel and Sandy Kurtzig and and uh, yeah. Shugart and so on. Where did it go from there? From there, it just again, you know, I was very fortunate that I ended up being the travel agent for a lot of the venture people. So Kleiner Corbins, Sequoia Ventures. So every time they funded a company, I was the agency of choice. So it was really, it was Larry Sonsini for the law. It was Regis McKenna for, for marketing, and it was me for travel. And uh, so, you know, and so by nature of that, every account that came in was handled by us. So they grew and then Casto Travel grew, and it was just unbelievable. The growth was phenomenal. And it was to the point that we could no longer control the growth. I mean, we were hiring people just because we needed bodies. To the point that the service level at Casto, I felt was was really bad, and um, I called everybody in and said, "We can't do this. We we're making mistakes, and that's not who we are as a company. That's not why we started this business." And so we we stopped all business. We just said we're not getting new business until we fix it. And so from then on, we really paid attention to people. When we hired people, they had to make sure that they understood the value of what this company was, that it wasn't just a job, it was part of being the responsibility of carrying that name, because that is what we had, you know, we wanted to support whatever we said we were going to do. And, uh, and I, I think that I think we were able to do that. Yeah. So you had a relentless focus on customer service. But some of the customers you were dealing with, themselves were a little difficult to deal with. And some of your stories about Steve Jobs, I have to ask you to share some of those. Yes. Um, (laughs) You know, I learned a lot from different people. And um, so Steve was a difficult client. And I have to say, I, I, I didn't learn much from him because I didn't want to, I didn't want to be like him. Um, 
he he was the first call I did when I had Apple, when I started handling Apple was I got a call and uh, in, the, in the phone and he was screaming. And I, I, I thought, why are you screaming? He said, I'm at the airport. It was in San Jose and this flight, this airplane is not what I want. It's a smaller airplane. I said, well, that's what the, the flight is. That's the airplane we this have. This was a commercial flight. This was a commercial flight. And he just was oh, he's screaming and shouting. And I thought, uh, what do you want me to do? And he said, well, I want you to do something. I said, Steve, it's a commercial flight. Do you want me to get an, uh, a private plane for you? No, I want you to fix it. And he would just, I hung up on him. I thought, you know what? I'm not going to listen to him. He was doing a tantrum. And then he calls back. And I think he just calmed down. And you know, he just told me how upset he was. But he took the flight. And, you know, it was all these little things that Steve did that I just felt um, he could have done a better way of communicating. I think he was rude, he was arrogant, and people just put up with it, and especially the women. And I have to tell you, one of the people I wrote in my book, Debbie Coleman, who I just understood passed away, I mean, she was, she got, she got a bad deal as well. I mean, all of them, many of them, I mean, and... I, I just felt like, you know, uh, I put up with Steve, but, and there was part of him where he was also very, very good. I mean, he was very loyal uh, when he was booted out of Apple. The first call he got was me. He called me and said, I want you to handle next. And so I took that account and grew it. And then we came back, when he came back to Apple, again, we were still handling Apple. Um, but, you know, the instances of Steve's, I just don't go with that. I just feel like, you know, you, you could be a better example. And um, and then you have Was, who's so different. And he was such a nice man, and even so now. And then uh, Andy, his style of management was very different. You don't make mistakes, very paranoid. And, you know, you make sure everything you say you're going to do, you do. But he was also very loyal. And I remember one time uh, we were in the... I was having a big event at my house. Uh, I was supporting the, um, I think it was the rep, and we had invited um, one of the directors of the Sound of Music, I think it was. I can't remember his name right that's now. That's the San Jose Repertory Theater. Yes. yes no longer right. around, but just to clarify. Right. That's the same. Thank you for reminding me about that. And I had invited, um, when Intel got to the point where it was so big, uh, we had to rebid it and they decided they were going to bring another travel agency in. And I was, I was okay with that because I knew that Intel was such a big account that if anything happened, I would have put all my eggs in one basket and I didn't want to be in that position. So I had given a dinner in my house and I had invited Andy and Eva, who I think Eva is, was the strength behind Andy in so many ways. Um, but also the agency that was the other agency that was servicing them, I also knew them and I also invited the owner to come and join me in the dinner. So when United Airlines, who also was in my dinner, saw them and said, I don't understand, why do you have both people? Why do you have yourself and your competitor in the dinner? I said, because the whole point is to make sure that Intel is in the right, that they have the right support uh, agencies to support them. Uh, and so when I had him sit beside Andy, uh, Hal Rosenbluth, who was the other agency servicing them. So Andy asked him who he was. And he said, I'm your new travel agent. <laughs> and Andy said, no, you're not. Marilis will always be my travel agent. So that kind of shows you the, the loyalty that we all had for each other and how we support it. And I always believe that, you know, competition is good. You know, you just have to be sure that... Uh, you do a better job. Yeah. Keeps you on your toes. Yeah. A couple of questions from our audience. Um, uh, then we'll get back to what happened next in the travel industry. But um, one person wants to know, uh, as you were trying to ensure that your company had the ultimate in customer service for these very important clients, how did you um, choose the employees or how did you uh, decide who would be your most stellar hires and, and ensure that the employees would do the work well and represent the company well? In, uh, in the start of the company, when we were growing, 
uh, we always made sure that it went through all of us before we would approve somebody to come in. And that was the, the, the old way of doing it. And then when we were growing so fast, we were just hiring people back and forth. And I remember there was one woman that I was so impressed with her resume and she had it all. And, um, and I decided I was gonna hire her and everybody in my team said, no, she's not a team player, we shouldn't. And I, I didn't follow my own rules and I did, I hired her, but they were absolutely right. She was horrible for us. She did not perform as we all wanted her to perform. And so I had to let her go. And from then on, I realized that, you know, so many people are cast to have different kinds of skills and it took all of us to make this happen. So I always try to listen to when, when people are applying at Casto and we go through a whole process. They have to be castoized, as we always say, and it gets approval from everybody. Because, you know, it's a different culture. It's not for everybody. But the people that stayed at Casto, and I, I cannot speak more about what Casto Travel is. The, it is all about the people. They really believe in, in the, we had this thing about it was, you never so no, no is not an option. You always have to find a, a way of doing it in, in a way that serves the clients and, and us as well. Uh, there were just so many lessons and we had a whole lessons of um, the top 10 of what you had to be mm -hmm. to be able mm -hmm. to be a custom mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. agent. So we were very particular about mm -hmm. who was who was part of the Casto team. Uh, and just, it was, yeah. You, you've told me a few stories over the years of uh, extraordinary service. The way that you support travelers uh, when they're out on the road, when things come up. Uh, tell us a couple of stories about kind of uh, empl your employees going above and beyond to uh, support the travelers uh, traveling on your, you know, with your. Uh, well, yeah. 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 Well, I mean, uh, uh, and I think I write about them in the book too, about, you know, uh, who they are and what made Castro unique as, as the company. I would probably say one of them was Lynn Dorner, and I remember her well because Lynn, we were bidding on one account, and uh, one of the travel managers there was looking for another agency that she wanted. But, you know, to be able to secure the account, Lynn and Francis was, uh, was calling on them, and they said, we want an on-site agent. With no hesitation, Lynn said, I will be your on-site agent. She was a manager at the time. But I train all of the managers to also be agents. So they're always available. They pitch in when we're busy, they pitch in, become agents. And that wasn't normal for us. But Lynn said, I'm going to be the on site agent. So we started an on site for her. Um, and then, you know, we had clients. Um, she had a client. We also had a visa passport that took care of all our clients' needs. In fact, the story in that, if I can just regress for a moment, Steve Wozniak, uh, we were doing it passport for him and in the application Steve just put name he put was w-o-z of course so we go to the passport office to get that done passport office says that's not a real name so they rejected <laughs> it so we called Steve and said hey listen you have to reapply and I put your real name he said was is my real name that's what I want and so he researched it that he could use it because it was legally so, I mean, just like, so we went back in and Steve probably is the only one that has was is his passport. I mean, <laughs> you know, to the extent of what we do. And then we had one client that, you know, needed his passport and we had to fly to, to I think it was back east to be able to meet him just before his flight was um, going and we presented his part. The, the impossible things that we did, we made it possible. You know, one of the clients wanted, he was entertaining a group and wanted to be at the French Laundry and, Magda was pitching the concierge service and they said, well, if you give us the French laundry, you have the account. She had no idea how she was going to do it, but she did it. Every day she called the French laundry. And finally, the day before we got there, they never knew what was the behind the scenes, but there were so many stories like that. So many stories. And again, you always knew that whatever you said, they would back it up. Everybody at the company did that from the delivery people all the way to Mark, um, Mark's um, coming into the company. I mean, changed a lot of the things that we were doing in a better way because I was like a cowgirl. 
I mean, I just Mark, jumping ahead. Mark is your son who ended up president of the company, but we'll get yes. back to that. Okay. I want to talk next about disruption in the travel industry. You begin the book with the story of how your company was a case at Harvard Business School. Correct. The travel industry has been through major disruptions. Uh, first, you know, with the internet, with people then starting to make their own reservations. And then, of course, recently, we've had the huge disruption of no travel, basically, for a year and a half. So tell us a little bit about these successive disruptions. And from a business strategy standpoint, how did you handle the major disruptions in your industry? Well, uh, 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 the start of the book talks about my experience when I was asked to present to Harvard as a case study and saying the internet is here and how will the travel industry survive, especially agencies like mine. But long before that, as I said, being in Silicon Valley and knowing exactly what our clients are looking for, we were prepared. We already knew the internet was coming and we were not going to, you know, we were not going to hide and say, it's not, it is here. So how do we prepare for it? And we were doing a big meeting for Silicon Graphics. I think there are like 3000 people going to Europe, to Munich, I think. And so we had to understand how would we handle this trip? And this is the case study I presented to Harvard when they asked me to come. And how would we handle this trip? And I knew that handling it in the regular way, I would have had to hire 35 or 40 people just because the employees were traveling. And when they traveled, they were going to do extensions. They were going to do a trip before or after, and they would be looking at either tours or trails or you know hotels extension. We couldn't do it if we were just looking at the traditional way. But then, hey, if we could use the internet because they already had a website, we thought, well, why don't we have a link in their website so that they themselves can create the trips they want? And that was how we innovated. But it took one year for us to implement, to understand what internet was going to do to us. And we either embraced it or we walked away from it. And we're not walking away from anything. So that was how we decided to do that. And that was what I presented to Harvard, that we had a solution for it. And you know, we, we did it well. And uh, we didn't have to use all these people. I think we only ended up using six or seven people where I could have used 35. So at that time, we were already understanding the impact of what the internet, the internet was. And then you have, you know, every time we feel like we've got one thing going, and then you get hit by recession. We had tremendous recession. We got hit with SARS. We got hit with September 11, even September 11. And, and again, you know, being that when we were growing so fast at that time, uh, we needed, again, the customer service was so important. I felt like clients would call us after work. How would we service them? We needed to think outside the box. We needed to be sure that we are available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Well, we couldn't do it in this valley because we couldn't find people. So where would we go? And I was having lunch with one of the senators from from um, South Dakota. And he was talking about the opportunities in South Dakota. And I said, well, I've never been there. I don't even know where South Dakota is, but I would like to be able to check and see if opportunities. And we were actually going to uh, Las Cruces, New Mexico to open another office, but they didn't welcome us. They felt that we were a threat and they didn't want to welcome us. So they all gone up and said, she's not coming. I don't know. But anyway, so South uh, Rapid City, so we flew in, we did a blind ad, found out we got 500 people who, who responded to our ad. And also United Airlines had a reservation center there. So it was a natural. So we opened an office there with the help of these, uh, the, the government, the, um, and then started the whole reservation center and then did our 24 hour service. So by having that knowledge of how to operate on a 24 hours gave us that solution. And, and so we started expanding into different areas and increased our vacation department, increased our um, concierge department, started building other businesses to fall under the Castle umbrella mm -hmm. office, started opening offices. So we had 15 offices within the United States at that time. Mm -hmm. 
So one of our audience members wants to know, from all of your colleagues in Silicon Valley who were used to having their industry disrupted, what was the best piece of advice you ever got and who was it from? Oh, wow, that's a good one. Got a lot of that. Um, uh, who was the one that gave me the best advice? I would probably still say maybe Andy, because Andy, I was always, when the company was growing so fast, I got intimidated because I felt like I couldn't continue handling this account. I mean, I didn't have the background. I didn't have the, the MBAs. All I had was MBAs of people. And I felt like, you know, maybe the company needed different um, kind of skills. So I would hire people. I would, I would call Andy and said, I'm hiring somebody in vice president sales or marketing. Would you interview them? And he did. He did it five times. And every time he would say they're not the right people, I would argue because I felt like, you know, but they were feeling something that my company needed. But he was always, he was right. He said, don't get, don't get, you know, forget about the, the titles and everything else. Look at what the people's value is that is building your company. And I think those were good advice, yeah. Um, and I, I guess working with my son too, Mark Castro, I mean, he gave me some really good advice, yeah. And, yeah, and putting the company together as we were growing, yeah. So um, t we've just been through another huge disruption. Now we're doing everything by Zoom and, Business travel, at least as far as I can tell, must be going through a big decline again because people are not, haven't been moving around. How do you see the current disruption? How is it affecting the travel industry? What, where is this going? Uh, I think we're almost over it now. I think next year, 2020, is going to be such a boom year. There's such bent up travel demands and I know that uh, a lot of the companies now are, are, are really trying to find people. Uh, that's the biggest problem right now is people finding the right people. But I, I feel so positive about where our industry is going and I think 2020 would be the year for it. Uh, so, you know, we've put in place, we know how to act and be prepared uh, for when a downturn comes again. So, you know, like, like we did when we opened the office in the Philippines, and now our Philippine office is doing very, very well because we're getting more business from our U.S. and Canada uh, for the support functions that they need. So I'm, I'm very positive as to we've learned a lot of, of the business in, in, in the downtime, and I think we could apply all of that when the business comes back and which I think is coming back. You think business travel will come back in some? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. No question. You need to then meet with me. People, Zoom is here to stay and that's great, but it's not, it's not the only way. And I think we're, we're looking at that too in, in, in even us in the Commonwealth Club. You mm -hmm. know, we want people to get back into our, our building, our beautiful building. Uh, and, and you can't, you know, you can do both. And if you are able to do both, I think that's success. Yeah. So as far as Casto Travel goes today, um, Mark, your son, became president of the company, and then the company was sold. But you have significant operations in the Philippines today, which I believe you continue to run. Tell us a little bit about the current state. state. In the Philippines and in the Philippines. Well, the Philippines really uh, was created when we couldn't, we knew we needed to expand. We couldn't just be, we wanted to go global because we couldn't find enough people here. And we thought it's either India or the Philippines. Well, being from the Philippines, I felt that that was the right place to be. And uh, long before that, I would say maybe 30 years ago, we bought a travel company in the Philippines, a small agency. And the reason we bought it is because I wanted to buy 51% of the company just to understand the options. And they were a very large holding company. They owned San Miguel Brewing Company. They owned the banks, the real estate. And they had this little travel agency to take care of their travel. So when we came and we bought it, I didn't realize what a nightmare it was because it was run so badly. So I brought in our whole team, redid everything, and it took five years to rebuild this. So we had a presence in the Philippines already. And when September 11 happened, I mean, the business stood still. 
we knew that we started laying off a lot of people in the United States, but we had the business in the Philippines. We started transitioning. All accounting became in the Philippines. Our after hours now started to be in the Philippines. So we started training our people in the Philippines. In fact, our first employees from the Philippines came to Rapid City to train. It was in the middle of winter, poor things. I and mean, we had never been exposed to snow and here they are learning about the business. And so we, we started that whole Philippine office to support the US. Uh, and when we sold Casto Travel, again, the, the, the company that bought us Flight Center is also a client of us in the Philippines because they use our support services. So September 11 really made us realize the impact of having an offsite and we positioned us in the Philippines. So we already had the people in the Philippines all trained. And in fact, last night I was in the Philippines, we were talking, we started a Casto University again. We put that in an, on hold because of the pandemic, but they are training 10 new people in another province. We have now expanded our base, not just in Manila, but in another province. And we're starting to recruit people. So we're really reinventing what we had in Castro US and replicating it with Castro Travel Philippines. And I know your, some of your siblings had been involved in the business in the Philippines. Correct, Correct. yeah. Gus, my brother, was, was involved and run the Philippine operations. Mark ran the Castro US and Gus ran Castro Philippines. And having the two of them was was you know was very it was very important for the success of the company. So I had both of them, and uh, guiding me and helping us as we got the company going. So many levels to your company: a family company, a multinational company, a company in a challenged industry. Um, really, <laughs> so and and in an industry connected to the exploding Silicon Valley technology industry. Right. What an amazing uh, array of interesting aspects and challenges. Yes, yes. And Gloria, even now when I look at it, I think, how did we all do it? I mean, you know, we lived it. And I think it was really important And when somebody said, why did you write your book? I felt like it was time to do so. And I just wanted to say thank you really to so many people. And, and they're not here now, but the impact they did, not just on, on the company, but the history of what Silicon Valley was all about. I wanted them to understand what it was when I first arrived and what it was to grow a business. And, 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 and you know, I'm, I am here to live to see it and recreating another business, yeah. So um, let's talk a little bit about your activities in the community here and mm -hmm. uh, in the Philippines also. So you, um, in terms of saying thank you, it's not just saying thank you in your book, you've served on a number of boards, uh, the Exploratorium, the um, San Jose uh, Cleveland Ballet, the Commonwealth Club. Tell us a little bit about how, what you've gotten involved in in, in the community, uh, why those organizations? Well, because I also thought I, I, you know, I, I wanted to give back. I think I have been very fortunate, and I have, you know, I've, I've had been, I've been successful, and I, I really believe that our community needs it. Our community needs the art. Our community needs involvement of people that have the skills, and and you know, and why not? And why don't you donate in the areas that could really use some donations and help? And I, I always felt that that is your life that is not just the business, your life extends to everything around you. And it's also how you train your kids. I want to be able to have Eleanor and Abigail see that, you know, you need to be involved in the community. Now, Julie, my daughter-in-law, was very involved in the Mexican Heritage Plaza and the things that she's done to be able to, you know, so you have to participate. You have to make sure that you show that you value of the community, and, and you know, and, and you know, like like the, the, the Commonwealth Club. I love the Commonwealth Club, but to see where it is now and how you handled it during the pandemic, and how we grew from, you know, from what we were doing before and where it is now. I mean, 
you know, the exploratorium. I help help being, being, being the exploratorium. I pass by there now, I see it and I see all the people going in. I thought how wonderful that we were able to help participate. So my plea to everybody, all the people that are, have a business, you know, give and participate because that is how our community grows. And it's the examples we set, yeah. Well, so I believe in that. So um, I can attest from experience to what you've done for the Commonwealth Club, and I know for the other nonprofits as well. It's often said that in Silicon Valley, uh, the, the companies don't give back in their own community. And what you did was to introduce us to your contacts in the tech world and through your long relationships with them, interest them in coming and becoming involved in the Commonwealth Club and supporting us and getting involved in our projects. And um, so you have, you know, utilized your goodwill to bring people from the tech industry into the organizations, the people you've worked with for decades into the organizations you've been involved with. So it's been very interesting to watch that phenomenon. It kind of goes against the the theory that the tech industry doesn't support its own community, but it takes a connector like you to that has built this goodwill over a long, a long period of time to then bring those individuals from the tech industry into the nonprofits in the community. That's really true. That's very, very true. You show connections because that's really what you're doing. You're giving them an opportunity to participate. And, uh, and some of them don't know about it, you know? So if you are on the board, that's what you have to, you, that's what you do. Yeah. Because you are, you're enjoying being on that board and your goal is to be able to, to spread that around so that other people can participate in other areas, whether it's their marketing skills, whether it's their sales skills, whether it's their financial, but everybody that is a board member gets involved. And, and then you focus on what needs, what the company needs or what the organization needs and do it. I, I found that you are generous and you bring your own support and strength, but you also bring your your team with you, um, yes. are those you've worked with and uh, developed the relationships with over the years. So let's talk a little bit about the Philippines. To what extent has is Casto Travel involved in the community there? Does it, I know it hires people, employs people. Is Are your siblings and you involved in any organizations or causes or activities in the Philippines? Not as much as we should, really. I, I think that's that's where we're a little bit. Um, we, we need to do more. And one of the things that uh, I, one of the things I always wanted to do was to help maybe an orphanage because I think that that's you know there's so many so many people in the Philippines that really need help, and I'm involved with um, the Philippine International uh, Aid, which is run by my very good friends Mona Lisa Yochenko and uh, where we contribute, we donate, and then we help children go back to school, you know, in the school programs that they have, and educate, uh, you know, I mean, I, I think there is more that we could do, and I think that would be my focus for the next couple of years, is to give back much more than I have given, and, uh, and maybe do a better job than I have had. Well, you've certainly given back in terms of creating economic opportunities there and jobs, and you've certainly given back in the Bay Area community here. So tell us, uh, just going from there, though, what what else is on your agenda uh, in the coming years? (laughs) What else is in my agenda? Well, let's see now. Where Mark goes, I go. (laughs) I just bought a house in Baxford, uh, Massachusetts, because that's where Mark and Julie, Abigail, and Eleanor are. And so uh, that would be my home there uh, for during maybe four or five months a year. Uh, and in fact, Marilyn, who works with me in my office, said, so are we now going to the East Coast? <laughs> and will we have our little office and that the bird will fly to the East Coast? Um, so that's that's where I'm kind of going. And, uh, and uh, it's, I'm at the part of my life where I'm really having fun. I'm really enjoying. Again, I keep my, my interest. Uh, uh, so I, I don't remember now what the question was. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, uh, just what else is on your agenda? What You've now written your book. Do you have any other particular projects that you're thinking about? I know being close to your 
kids and your grandkids is very high priority. It's very high priority. But again, I have a life. I'm a California girl. I always will be California girl. And I have, uh, you know, I mean, I, I, I participate. I just got on the board of the Filoli uh, because I really love Filoli. I think it's a great organization. And then I'm getting into the board, uh, uh, a new board that I also feel Charlie Cart, which I really feel that they do. It's an educational program for teaching kids how to cook. And, you know, and, you know, there's a lot of different areas that I feel like this is my time and I, I, I want time to give. And yeah. And then this is also my time I give to myself. I just bought a casita in in Tecate, Mexico. I've been going to Rancho La Puerta for so many years, for 30 years. And Pony and I are just, you know, funny. Martinez is a very good friend of mine. Uh, we bought this and we're now, yeah, Las Hermanas, the Rancho, as we call ourselves. Uh, it's going to be finished by the end of the year, so that would also give me a chance to to be, you know, in Mexico. And I, 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 I as one of my role models, I look at Deborah Seckley from Rancho La Puerta. She's 99 years old, and she started this whole ranch in uh, Tecate, but she's very involved in Tecate, the Mexicans. And, and I, I want to be able to see if I can help in any way and participate there as well, yeah. Well, and I know... Um that you went through a very tough time with Mardell who got yes, Parkinson's and you nursed him and took care of him for many, many years. Yes. And so I know some of what you've been through. And uh, in addition to all of your business leadership and success and philanthropy, so we have only a few more minutes, but let's, let's uh, talk about travel for a second, which we really haven't talked about. One of our audience members wants to know, what is one place you think everybody should visit during their lifetime? Oh, wow. There's so many other places to visit. And that's where I think like, I, I feel like I've got as only a certain amount of time to visit the places I've always wanted to visit. But one place that really draws me is I want to go back to Cambodia. I want to see the Angkor Wat because I went there 40 years ago and the trees were just, I mean, it was so beautiful. You could go walk in and, and now I know you can't because, I mean, you know, it's very hard to get in because of the traffic of it. But this is the perfect time to go because there's nobody there. And take advantage of this time, you know, places you would never go, take this and do that. I want to go to Bhutan. I've never been to Bhutan. So that's another area I, I want to go. And you know, just, just, I don't know. I'm, I'm very excited. There's so many places in the world I want to see. Yeah. yeah. And also I want to go back sailing again. Uh, we used to have a boat, the castaways, and I had so much memories about that. And I want to share just one story. When we were in Tahiti, Mark and Mardell and I were gone for one month and we were in Tahiti and I, I had, I went native, of course, you know, just Pareo and just my Pareo and, you know, so we were in, uh, one of the little t little inlets in there, and we had to go to town to buy groceries. And I walked into town. I went to this post office, and of course, I had my hair was not combed. I mean, I had this pareo. I had no shoes on. I mean, just local native. And walking into this post office was this very elegant man that had just come from the cruise. I think it was one of the princess cruises. They had just left, and he was going to the post office, and he had on a castor bag. And in my excitement, I said, oh, my God, Castro, I am Mirla's Castro. Mm -hmm. He looks at me and he says, <laughs> here I am, you're on my head. I mean, I just look. And, and I, 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 then I got so embarrassed. I have never found him. And my objective is to find him so that he can see that <laughs> I can have my little business suit and I kind of look like the Mirla's Castro of the book, <laughs> not this wahini girl that he found yeah i mean just the sailing and you know the enjoyment of you know being on the boat i enjoy that very much yeah. so so um that kind of illustrates though the duality of travel you know it, it's business and yet people do it so that they can let their hair down and walk around in a pareo and bare feet and, yes, yes. and relax. So you've been able to provide people with both experiences, the high stress, high pressure business travel and, and the leisure that people need to balance. Let, let me come back as a last question to where we started, which is you emigrated to the U S you, a woman um, married, but, you know, without a lot of friends or network in the U.S., 
what do you feel provided you with the opportunity, I mean, the access to American society? How did you feel you were able to come into this society and succeed? What are the main qualities about American society and the people that you met here that helped with your success? Basic qualities of this society. I think very accepting of that, that uh, not judgmental at that time. I never even knew what a minority meant. I mean, I, it never even dawned on me. And, uh, and I just felt like everybody really was very helpful. They really wanted to make, I felt very welcome. I did. And I, I did. And I have to say, I got it a lot from the men because that was all I, I was very, I didn't have a lot of women friends at that time. We were all very, very busy. And, but I, that I was, that they paid attention. They, they took everything I said seriously. And that um, I, I was allowed to be me. And, um, and again, I was never afraid. I just felt there was nothing to be afraid. If you make a mistake, you learn from that. You pick yourself up. And I never went into that poor me kind of all because I was discriminated. I was I never felt that because I I I just think I felt like I have I had something I wanted to do. I never look backwards, I only look forward and take advantage of every opportunity that is offered because there are so many opportunities. I really believe that. You just have to find it and seek it and, and, and do the same thing, help the people that are starting. And that's what I wanna do, extend my hand and say, come up because that's what I, I got. And people were, everybody kind of wanted to help and I want to help. Well, the welcoming attitude of our uh, society towards immigrants is something to really, I yeah. think, to really preserve. And you are such a terrific example of somebody who met with that welcome and has created great uh, accomplishments and value and given back significantly to, to this country and to this society. So thank you. I'm afraid we are at the end of our time. Uh, our great thanks to Mary Les Casto, Mm-hmm. author of A Hole in the Clouds, From Flight Attendant to Silicon Valley CEO, to the Bernard Osher Foundation for supporting today's Good Lit event. We encourage you to pick up your copy of Mary Les's new book at your local bookstore. Uh, remember the club's really important program tomorrow with Mary Daly, the president of the San Francisco Federal Reserve on inflation and interest rates, uh, either in person or virtual. You can find that event uh, and support the Commonwealth Club at commonwealthclub.org. I'm Gloria Duffy, and for Mary Les and me, uh, saying goodbye, and we'll see you the next time. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thanks.